Restless Hearts John Dietrich by Robin Flans. Country music has done a good deal of changing in the past few years. It still has its traditional artists like George Jones and newcomers to that style like Randy Travis. But currently there is a very large portion of country that, had it been released in the 70s, would have been considered rock music. Today, for example, the Eagles, pre-Hotel California work would probably fit most comfortably on country radio. Perhaps the most exciting group of that kind to stir the country airwaves is Restless Heart. In fact, while their country rock music can be heard on country radio, and their second album, Wheels, rose to number one on the country charts, a few of their songs crossed over and became AC adult contemporary hits. Ironically, Restless Heart's drummer, John Dietrich, started out playing neither rock nor country music. He started as a jazz drummer. John's dad had enjoyed playing drums as a youngster. And while the senior Mr. Dietrich became a surgeon, his son followed in his musical footsteps. The difference was that John took music very seriously. It came naturally to him and became all he wanted to do. He studied with Ed Shaughnessy while attending a community college and went on to North Texas State, where he admits to having less than wonderful experiences. He regrets having turned down the drum seat in Woody Herman's band in 1979, but he had already planned to move to Los Angeles. Seeking to conquer his musical dreams of playing in a successful band, John finally landed in Nashville. His dedication paid off. The dream is finally coming true. John, I'll tell you exactly when I got serious about being a drummer. I had never heard a drummer who really excited me until I got to high school. All this time, I had dabbled with violin and trumpet on the side. And at one point in school, I was actually playing timpani in the percussion section and running to the trumpet section to play third trumpet parts. I remember the high school band director asking me who my favorite drummer was. I was brought up with the Beatles and Rolling Stones, but Ringo and Charlie Watts, although excellent at what they do, didn't excite me. He asked me if I had ever heard of Buddy Rich, and I said, Buddy who? And he said, come with me. He took me to the listening room of the school, and he played Buddy's Swingin' New Big Band, where he did the West Side Story medley. I was sitting there dumbfounded, listening to his solo and saying, that's impossible, nobody can do that. Then I was on a quest. I went out and got that album and started dissecting his style. Over a period of years and many, many hours in my basement, I learned to play by analyzing his style and an incredible respect for the way the man played with a band developed. A lot of times it was just as exciting to hear him play with a band or behind a soloist as it was to hear him do a drum solo. To this day, I listen to those recordings and it still blows me away that he could do what he did. But that's what lit the fire. Robin, what did you do after you got that fire lit under you? John, I started practicing like a demon. Robin, did your father encourage you? John, yes and no. He was encouraging from the standpoint that at least it was keeping me off the streets. He felt I was learning discipline, how to plan my time, and how to study, which he was extremely happy about. He was not really keen on the idea of my going into music as a full-time vocation, however, because it is such a difficult business. And although he knew very, very few people who had ever done that for a living, he had heard all the horror stories of the music business. I think the turning point with Dad was when I took him to New York when I was studying with Ed Shaughnessy, and he saw the level of professionalism in the whole organization of the Tonight Show band. He liked Ed a lot, and he saw how things worked. I think he began to realize I was serious about it. Robin, let's talk about the training you had leading up to Ed. John, I had never studied drum set per se until I studied with Ed, because when I was going to high school and I really started playing seriously, there weren't any drum set teachers. I was forced more or less to learn on my own. Robin, how did you go about it? John, by listening to records and sitting down behind a set and analyzing what a drummer was doing, how a drummer achieved a certain pattern, the sticking, how many different ways there are to play the same lick on a set of drums, etc. Robin, what material were you dissecting? John, I was listening mostly to big band jazz at the time, a lot of Buddy Rich. I had also gotten into some small band jazz and some drummers like Tony Williams, who at the time I didn't understand at all. What Tony Williams was doing was so far over my head, and I'm talking about the early stuff with Miles. 
I would sit down behind my drums after I had listened to a certain track on an album three, four, or five times and had gotten the basic feel. I would isolate the trouble spots and play those spots over and over again until I actually had most of them memorized. Then I would sit behind the drums with a set of headphones on and play through the track until I had memorized and was able to play almost the exact figures that the drummer on that particular track was playing. I had a great deal of difficulty with solos. They took me the longest to figure out, and some of them I could never do. There was a live Oscar Peterson album on which I believe Paul Motion was the drummer. He did this incredible drum solo in 3-4 time, which I sat down and copied almost lick for lick. But there were certain sections of it that I didn't have any idea of what he was doing. But by not having a teacher, I had such a natural curiosity about how things were put together that I was off in my own world and not stuck with a preconceived notion of how to play a ride cymbal or the proper technique of the left hand. All I knew was, this is what I hear, this is what I want to play, and how can I play it? This is where my technique actually grew from. And it grew mostly from the common sense approach of, what is the fastest way to get from a snare drum to a cymbal? Robin, these are the advantages of teaching yourself, yet you knew you needed to have the formal education too. How did you know that? John, I was fairly good in high school with reading concert band snare drum material, but when the high school dance band put a chart in front of me, that could have been hieroglyphics. It was an entirely new set of rules. You cannot look at a drum chart and strictly interpret what is written because it's not a concert piece. A lot of times they will notate a ride cymbal pattern as a dotted eighth note followed by a 16th note. If you literally interpret that, you're not going to swing with the band because you're going to sound like a concert snare drummer interpreting a jazz chart. Robin, how do you integrate that? John, I saw what was on the page and tried to play it correctly the way it was notated, but that didn't work. I wasn't playing what the band was playing, so my band director pointed out to me that he realized it was written that way, but the way it was played was more of a triplet feel. They literally had to walk me through all these different ways of interpreting the different things you see on a piece of music. I was trying to play it all. There were four beats on the bass drum, and I saw two and four on the snare drum written, and the ding, ding, a ding, ding, a ding on the cymbal. I was playing all this, but it didn't swing. Over a period of time, I gradually came to realize that it's a roadmap that tells you where you are in the chart. It tells you major changes in tempo and gives you major ensemble figures to accent with the band. It took probably a year for me to make heads or tails out of the drum chart. Robin. At one time, you related a story to me about when you were in junior college in a progressive rock band that played a lot of Mahavishnu stuff, and when the audience wanted to hear the Rolling Stones, you realized you didn't know how to play a simple two and four groove. John, we started a group when I was in junior college called Mad Hatter that played very progressive fusion type music. We did some Mahavishnu Orchestra and Elvin Jones and things like that. We didn't really care whether we made any money at it. We did it for fun and to expand our own knowledge and abilities to play what we wanted to play. We were so different from anyone else at the time that we had trouble getting bookings. Our agent was telling us that the club owners were saying how unbelievable we were, but that the dance floor was empty. They wanted us to throw in a little contemporary rock and roll. And of course our reaction was, hey, we're players. But it did become an economic fact of life. The harsh reality hit me when I tried to learn a song called Brown Sugar, which I am sure most of us are familiar with. It's just straight ahead two and four garage rock, but I had no earthly idea how to play it. I was playing two and four, but the groove wasn't there because none of us in that band had really tuned in to a good bass groove or rhythm guitar, and a drummer has to lock into that. Robin. So all along you had been learning your individual instrument, and now you had to learn how to function within a group. John, exactly. We were a group of soloists who all of a sudden found themselves having to become a band. Robin. So what did you do? John. I took the records home of the material we were learning and really analyzed them. I had to listen quite a bit, and not just to the drums because that had been a big mistake of mine up to that point. I hadn't listened to other things, I had listened only to the drums. Then one day it dawned on me. That's really interesting what the bass player did with the drummer. And that's the key. 
what the bass player did with the drummer, what the rhythm guitar is doing with the keyboards. Then I realized I had been listening to myself play and not anyone else. And I couldn't play two and four because I didn't know what anybody else was doing. I started to listen to other people in the band and I began to play off of them rather than having the attitude of, I am the drummer, you follow me. That was a big attitude adjustment. Robin, when did you get into the orchestral approach? John, when I went to college, I had made the decision in high school that I wanted to go to North Texas State University because I wanted to play big band. I went to Onondaga Community College in Syracuse, New York, because I realized I was way behind in my musical education and that I was not going to be able to compete at a good four-year school. The music programs at the community colleges in New York State allowed me to get in at the college entrance level, and they gave me the opportunity to learn and to prove myself. It was a requirement as a percussion major to study orchestral snare, drum, mallets, and timpani. I remember my first formal lesson in college. I walked in, and the teacher wanted to see how advanced I was on snare drum. My reading wasn't great because I hadn't really had anybody show me reading at the college level, but he didn't think that was a problem. Timpani wasn't something that was difficult for me, but mallets were a whole different set of circumstances. He said, have you played mallets before? I said, no, I haven't. Okay, next week I want you to come in here and know all your major and minor scales, ascending and descending, three octaves. And I looked at him and said, what's a major scale? He pointed to a marimba and said, show me where middle C is. And I said, I don't know. He said, how did you ever get in this school? I explained that I had auditioned with two snare drum pieces. He showed me where middle C is in a major scale. I had to work like a dog to get it all done. And he gave me two weeks instead of one. But I did it. I had such a strong desire to succeed. The idea of flunking out of school scared me more than death itself. I worked very, very hard. And I was very successful at that level. I really came alive my last semester there, and I was making straight A's on all my lessons. Robin, how did you come in contact with Ed Shaughnessy? John, when I was in high school, our lab band director, Neil Hartwick, was very impressed with my desire to learn. There were several of us in that band with a burning desire to learn about music. But I was a senior at that time while the others were juniors and sophomores. I believe he decided to bring Ed Shaughnessy in because I had only one more year to go. I had never seen a true professional play in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Ed impressed me so much with his knowledge and the way he could read things so quickly and play with a band so well. The whole time he was there, I was on his heels like a puppy, bugging him constantly. Can I play some time for you? I was so hungry to find out how to be a good player. Finally, he said, okay, play some time for me. He had all his drums set off to the side of the stage, so I started dragging his entire set out. He said, do you need all that to play time? I said, gee, I don't know. He said, just get a cymbal. So I got the ride cymbal and a pair of sticks, and he said, okay, play me some time. And I think I said, what tempo? He said, it doesn't matter, just play some time. So I started on the cymbal, and all of a sudden, I couldn't move my arm. The stick wouldn't come down. I looked up and he had the end of the drumstick in his hand over my head. He had grabbed it in midair. He said, what are you doing way up here? I said, I don't know. I was totally stunned. He said, you play time on a cymbal. You can't keep good time up in the air away from the cymbal. He showed me how to do it accurately. Robin, what did you learn from watching a professional in that kind of situation? John, that I had a long, long way to Robin. When did you ask him if you could study with him? John, when I moved to Syracuse after high school, I decided I needed a good teacher. I had heard Buddy Rich on The Tonight Show say that Ed was the best there was. Robin, how far away is Syracuse from New York City? John, about 290 miles. I called Ed. He said he remembered me and asked how I was planning to get to New York to take lessons once a month. Thinking very quickly, I said, I'm going to fly. He said, okay and that if I were going to drive or take a bus, he wouldn't consider it because it would be too difficult. I'd never make it. The reality was that I couldn't take a plane. I didn't have enough money. I was working weekends learning how to play country and Western music in these little bars to make enough money to go down to New York. It took me a month to earn the money for the bus 
the lesson, and my meals, and pay for my lunches and gas to school. The only bus that would get me to Manhattan by 11 a.m. was a bus that left Syracuse somewhere between 1 and 3 a.m. This was not an express bus. It stopped at every stop, and I had a change to make in Albany, which was somewhere around 7 o'clock in the morning. I'd get into New York City around 10 o'clock. Robin, you once described Ed to me as no-nonsense. John, I learned that very early in my lessons with Ed. I once waited outside the room and listened to Ed with a student who was having a lot of trouble. I overheard Ed say, Look, I'm going to send you back to your other teacher. The man only had so much time that he could teach, and there were so many people who wanted to study with him. He didn't have time to coddle you along, so you either did the work and grasped it, or you didn't. I made a mental note right then and there that when you show up for a lesson with Mr. Shaughnessy, you either come prepared or don't bother going at all. The entire time I studied with him, I believe I only made one real serious error on something we were working on. I had practiced it the wrong way. It was a series of four-eighth notes in a rather fast pattern, and it was a swing tempo. I had practiced it playing all four-eighth notes with my left hand, so here I was at a tempo somewhere along the lines of 114, but of course it was uneven. Ed explained that when you have three or more eighth notes on the snare drum, come off the cymbal and play them hand to hand so they're even and precise. I had practiced it wrong for a month and it was so ingrained that I couldn't break it even after he corrected me. But right off, he instilled into me what it was going to take for me to be able to compete on a professional level. Robin, why did you choose North Texas State? John, I chose it basically because of the lab band program. My high school band director had a copy of the Lab 67 album when Ed Sof was in the band and they did a buddy chart called Norwegian Wood. It was a killer band and I was so impressed with the level of playing that I knew that was where I wanted to go. Robin, you have indicated to me that you had both good and bad experiences there. Can you be specific? John, looking back on the situation, I can see where a lot of the fault lay in my attitude. I guess I had this very idealistic attitude that a school was a place for ASO, demic learning, and not a place for politics. What I found at North Texas State University was a mixture of both. I guess I was a little spoiled because in my high school lab band, I was the only drummer who was ever in it because no one wanted to compete against me. I don't mean that egotistically, but no one wanted to compete against me because I worked my tail off. When I got to OCC, I auditioned against two or three other guys and I was in that lab band for five semesters. They held auditions every semester and no one knocked me out of that band. I got to North Texas State never having known what it was like to lose. I went through all the preliminary auditions and Steve Houghton and I were the only two to make it through the preliminaries to audition for the one o'clock lab band. The guy who auditioned us had been in that band for at least three semesters. His name was John Bryant and he was an incredibly good drummer. He sat Steve and me down and said, guys, flip a coin. You're neck and neck. Looking back, I have to say that Steve's sight reading ability was better than mine, but the audition wasn't as based on sight reading as it was being able to play different styles and tempos and fills within those styles and tempos. They were basically looking for a player with the ability to play different styles of music. I ended up in the nine o'clock band because by the time they got around to deciding who the drummer for the one o'clock was, there were no other openings. So here I was, 1,500 miles away from home, and I didn't have a band to play in. The only reason I even got in the nine o'clock band was that one of the trumpet players in the one o'clock was the director of the nine o'clock. He already had four drummers, but I went to him and said, Jack, I need to get in a band. He laughed and said, yeah, right. I heard you audition. What did you make, the two o'clock? I told him I didn't have a band, and he said he'd love to have me, although he already had four guys, so he said he'd split it up. Robin, what was the prerequisite for the Ed Shaughnessy Scholarship? John, you needed a recommendation from the faculty. They wanted the drummers showing the most promise and improvement. I have a suspicion that one of the reasons I got it was the fact that I had studied with Ed Shaughnessy but it was really based upon the fact that I fit the criteria for the scholarship. I got a lot of heat from other drummers around the school who thought Ed had something to do with it. I tried to explain that Ed had nothing to do with it. 
I guess they thought I called Ed on the phone and asked for the scholarship and that he called the school and told them to give it to me. The next semester, I was called to audition for the three o'clock and I made the five o'clock. Then all of a sudden, I was put back in the three o'clock, although I have no idea why. I didn't get along with the director of the three o'clock band at all, so we parted ways. I left school shortly thereafter. I'd had enough of it. I had been in school for four years, and I figured I had learned enough about what I wanted to do to be able to go out and pursue a career. Because for me, live playing was going to be my career. The degree program I was pursuing was only a certificate of performance. It wouldn't have allowed me to do anything else. So I figured it was time for me to go out in the real world and compete. I had some bad experiences at North Texas State, but I also had some good ones. Robin, you haven't gotten to any of those. John, I was playing in a fusion band there where we did a lot of Mahavishnu Orchestra and Frank Zappa. That was a good experience. Robin, what did you do next? John, I stayed in Dallas and worked in a little show band that went on the road to the finer holiday inns everywhere. My wife at the time was the lead singer and we fell victim to the typical showbiz marriage where we couldn't separate the marriage from the business. So that broke up. I was playing in a jazz fusion band that played country music for a month to make money and did the fusion and original material under another name. We played around at clubs for the door. I have tapes of that band that still blow me away. It was very much like the Dixie Dregs, but even a step beyond in weirdness. Robin, what was your game plan at this point? John, I figured I had to get back on my feet, first of all. I had gone through a divorce, and there are good sides and bad sides to everything, depending on where you want to look. I had no desire to remain flat on my back for any length of time, and without the ties, I had the freedom to go anywhere I wanted. First, I moved to Los Angeles and managed to survive for three months out there. I had no connections at all, so I ended up working in a record store, getting deeper and deeper in debt. I was so emotionally drained from the divorce that I wasn't thinking clearly. The friend I was staying with said, you came out here for all the right reasons at the worst possible time in your life. You're not able to deal 100% with yourself at this time, let alone what you're going to have to go through in this town to be a success. He told me to go home and regroup, and those were very wise words. I went home for a couple of months when a friend of mine called from Florida and said his band needed a drummer. So I went down to Florida, and we played a nice little supper club circuit. They were good players in that band. I also made some money, and I was living on the beach, which was wonderful. At that point in time, I was just interested in getting back on my feet. That's where I met Nancy, my present and last wife, and we were married shortly thereafter. It was Nancy who could see the growing dissatisfaction and unhappiness in me. I wasn't getting any younger. I was approaching 30 and still playing supper clubs. She sat me down one day and said, if you had your choice to do anything with your career that you wanted to do, and you didn't have to think about me and the kids, what would it be? I said, I really don't know if I've got what it takes to make it, and I'm surely not going to find out in Sarasota, Florida. I don't want to go to New York, and I've already been to LA. There's only one place left, Nashville. I hear it's smaller and easier to make those connections. I think I'd really like to go there and give it a shot. She said, you've got to find out for yourself. If you don't, sooner or later, you are going to become so miserable that our marriage won't be worth having. And I'm not going to have that. So we're going to sell the house and everything we own and move to Nashville. And that's that. How many other guys have a wife who is willing to give up a brand new home and a steady income on both sides to take a giant leap off into the great unknown? She is the reason I was able to come to Nashville. Robin, there seem to be such preconceptions about Nashville and the quality of musicianship there that in a way, it's surprising you settled there. John, when I first started thinking about coming to Nashville, I thought, I guess I can always go there because how hard can that be? I had never listened to country much, and of course this was a few years ago, so I thought the level of musicianship wouldn't be that great. When I moved here, I found that not only were country musicians extremely accomplished players, but there was a lot of jazz and rock and roll. All kinds of music. I don't think the rest of the United States is aware just how much of a musical center this is. Robin, how did Restless Heart come about? John. 
When I moved to Nashville, I had the promise of one audition. It was for the boys' band, who at the time were on Asylum Records. Two weeks later, they called and said they wanted to hire me. The bass player in the boys' band was Paul Gregg, and we developed a very close friendship and played well together. The boys' band only lasted about nine months after that, so Paul and I went our separate ways professionally. I worked a lot of live dates around town, restaurant-type gigs, and Paul continued to work with the Nashville Network. One day he came over to my place and played me a work tape that he and some other guys were doing. He asked me if I was interested and I said yes. It was country, but it was different. It sounded fresh and I really liked it. I met the other guys who were involved and I met Tim Dubois, who was putting together this little studio project. They wanted to audition me on Paul's recommendation, so I auditioned vocally in the Harmony Stack. The funny thing about auditioning for Restless Heart was that it wasn't a formal audition per se, but more of a feeling out process. And they didn't audition me on drums. I kept saying, don't you want me to play? And they would say, later. At this point, we're more interested in the vocals. Paul says you can play, so probably you can play. For a couple of months, all we did were vocal work tapes. Everyone had other things going, and we'd get together when we could. Finally, two months later, we got down to doing a track in the studio, and I guess it was okay. They said, yeah, you can play two and four pretty good. Robin, how interested were you in two and four coming from your background? John, I had learned a great truth. If you can't play time and you can't play a groove and you can't play with people, then you can throw all the technique in the world out the window. The most important contribution a drummer can make to any situation is, firstly, the ability to keep good time and keep everything solid. And secondly, the ability to interact with the other musicians in the band, to play off of them, play around them, and play with them. Robin, does Restless Heart utilize anything that you struggled all those many years to learn? John, oh yes, I incorporate a lot of technique into what I do with Restless Heart. I have developed a lot of hi-hat work that I do within the framework of particular songs, like doing a straight two and four rock beat pattern, then coming to the hi-hat and utilizing a 16th note open double stroke roll. Robin, is there a specific song you do that on? John, yes, on a song called Heartbreak Kid. Although I didn't play it on the record, I do play it live. During the verses in that song, there's a section where I'm just keeping straight time, eighth notes on the hi-hat, two and four on the snare, and basically one and three on the bass drum. Again, going along with what I said about listening to what the band is doing, you have to listen to what the vocalist is doing as well to add a little flourish to what's happening. So I had a little 16th note open roll to the hi-hat on one and then hit the snare drum on two. There are just little nuances in my playing that have developed within this band. I currently do a little eight-bar drum solo in a bluegrass-feeling song called Hummingbird. It's what they call in Nashville a train feel. I play that particular beat hand-to-hand, -hand, which a lot of drummers don't do. A lot of them will keep the first three sixteenth notes in their left hand or their right hand and just play the accent in the other hand. When I say I do it hand-to-hand, -hand, I mean if the first accent falls on the right hand, the second will fall on the left hand. It's actually a paradiddle with the accent on the third beat of the paradiddle. That's how I'm able to slide in and out of that particular pattern into a subtle little buzz roll here and there. I'll double the accents a lot between the snare drum and the bass drum. I'll play the same accent on two different drums. In my eight bar drum solo, I cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. I end with a military cadence type of ending and then the old timey New Orleans quarter note triplets back into the tune. Robin, how do you coordinate your singing and your playing? John, when you are singing, you just have to trust your ability and the band's ability to keep good time. I have to think much more about the phrasing of the vocals and being in tune because I've done two and four for so many years now, and I have the confidence in my ability to maintain that. We're very fortunate in the band that everyone's sense of time is so good, so we don't worry about it too much. You do have to split your thinking a little bit, and you have to be able to shift constantly back and forth between being a vocalist and being a drummer. When I come back out of a vocal ensemble passage and I'm back to just being a drummer, during the first couple of bars, I'll concentrate a little more on being steady with the tempo. 
That goes along with listening to what everybody else in the band is doing. If I'm locked with the bass player and with the guitar player, it's wonderful. But you can't consciously sit there and pick apart every little detail of what you're doing. Because if you did, you wouldn't be able to do either one. You're trusting your instinct, your sense of time, and the people you're playing with. Robin, you didn't play on all of the first album. John, I used to feel very defensive about that, but I haven't for a long period of time. It was simply the fact that Tim Dubois, who produces us along with Scott Hendricks, put up his own money to go in and master seven songs, so that if we did get a record deal with a major label, the record company could already have those masters. Tim was spending about $30,000 of his own money, and he came to me and said, John, I have not worked with you in the studio enough to trust that we can get this done as quickly as we need to. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings, but I've got a lot of money out. So he worked with a drummer by the name of Dennis Holt, who had a lot of very creative ideas. Robin, what did you know about the studio at that point? John, not a lot. I had next to no experience in the studio, and that was extremely frustrating to me, because how do you get experience in the studio? You do it, but how do you get in the studio if you have no experience? Robin, what was the answer to that? John, I asked a lot of questions. I had a couple of discussions with Larry London, who was a wealth of information about the technical aspects of drums and tuning, but he can't tell somebody how to play or what to do. So I asked questions until I realized that people couldn't really tell me what to do or how to do it. It was just an experimental process, and you pick up as many tips as you can from people, and you try different things. Robin, did you end up doing the rest of the first album? John, yes. When we were signed by RCA and had a recording budget to fill out the rest of the album. Robin, tell me about your equipment and your method of tuning. John, a lot of people come up and compliment our drum sound. And I say our drum sound because it's a combination of the way I tune the drums, the way I actually play them, and the way our sound man, Dan Spomer, mixes the drums. Dan is a drummer himself, so he pays a lot of attention to the drum sound. I find that on eight ply maple drums especially, a fiber skine thin on the resonating side and a coated ambassador on the batter side work well in most instances, with the tuning on the bottom head approximately a major second higher than the top head, which gives me just a little bit of a dip sound. You have to experiment. Every drum is different. When I get a new set of drums, I go through many different combinations on one drum, usually one of the middle tom toms. Right now I'm using Pearl, eight inch, 10 inch and 12 inch rack, toms and 14 inch and 16 inch floor toms. So usually I'll work with the 12 inch in the different head combinations. I found that sometimes on a 10 inch tom, you have to use a little bit thinner head on the batter side to get the ring you want. If you use two real thick heads on a 10 inch tom, you're going to get a thud. Robin, can you get a little more specific about the tuning? John, I like the toms to be open. I don't like to have to dampen them down too much, but of course, for microphones, we have to do that. The only dampening I'll do is on the floor toms. I'll put two or three pieces of duct tape on one spot of the drum, or I may put it in a triangular pattern depending on what it sounds like. Other times I might tape one longer piece near the rim and I'll tape the rim as well. That seems to cut down on a lot of the overtones. I have also found that rims really open up the sound of the drum. I don't like tom-tom arms going into drums because they really cut down on the tone. Robin, what other equipment do you use? John, I use Dean Markley 5A sticks. That I use such small sticks in an amplified, big concert hall situation might surprise a lot of people, but Dean Markley makes a 5A stick that I really love. I use racket grip tape, which is a gauze tape that I wrap my sticks in to keep a good grip under the hot lights. I also use Sabian cymbals. Robin, what is it that you want to achieve as a player? John, this right here is the mountain I've always wanted to conquer. This is a trip to the top for me, though making it to the top is all relative to the individual. We have been extremely successful, and a lot of people would think we've made it. But I think there's always another step to take, even within restless heart. When you start to stand still, that's the day it's over. Musically, however small that step may be for Restless Heart, there's always another step. As a player, 
there are always new things you run into that you want to learn about and explore. What's next immediately for the group is to make a great third album, keep on touring, and continue our upward mobility as recording artists. Like anything else, there will come a day when this ends. After that, I really don't know. Mark Herndon of the band Alabama and I had a discussion the other day, and I was telling him about my fascination with the stock market, and he said, you know what? You're never going to be a stockbroker. Buddy Rich played till the day he died. After Alabama and Restless Heart are over, you and I are going to go out every week, get on a bus, and go somewhere to play. This is what we do, and this is our life.